lovely stuff. I think that's uh, just about everyone for now. I'm sure there might be one or two who kind of join um, once we started, uh, but let's kick things off now. So hello, uh, good evening. Welcome to this evening's Cooperation Live event. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Emma Foody. I'm Assistant General Secretary at the Cooperative Party. Um, and I'm really delighted to be able to welcome you to this evening's event, where we're going to be discussing the recent paper from the Cooperative Party entitled Steps to Success Lessons from Cooperatives in Education. Um, but before I introduce our panel of speaking, speakers this evening, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping for those of you who perhaps this is the first event that you have come along to, um, and a couple of tips on being able to participate as well. So first of all is that for those of you who might be hard of hearing, we will do work with RNID to close caption our events, um, so you can access that on this call this evening. And the second is just to say that our Zoom calls are recorded. A lot of our members can't necessarily access it at the time that it's um, that it's advertised to. So what we like to do is make them available on our YouTube channel. And um, so if for any reason you don't want your picture to be seen on that, you can of course just switch your camera off. And um, but similarly, if you want to watch this back, or if you've got uh, colleagues or fellow cooperators uh, who you think would appreciate the discussion this evening, then please just direct them, as I say, to our YouTube channel. Uh, everyone who's joined the call has been muted as you've come in. That's just to make the call clearer and make sure that there's no background noise. So only those who are speaking or are asking a question at a particular time will be able, will, will have their kind of sound enabled. And so we've got three fantastic speakers that we're going to hear from um, tonight. So just in terms of how the kind of event's going to run, we're going to hear from one of our speakers, um, Joe, and then we're going to have an opportunity for just a couple of questions on the particular parts of the report that he's kind of mentioned. And then we'll come to our other two speakers as well. So just in terms of your participation for that, there will be, as I say, the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you can either pop them in the chat box or if you want to re raise your virtual hand, uh, we'll come to you um, as as much as we can we want to include obviously as many questions as we can um, and we'll just have to see how many time allow for uh, when it's your turn to ask we'll unmute you so that we can hear you and um, so just to introduce our speakers as i said we've got three fantastic speakers who joined us this evening to talk about their experiences with education in the roles that they have we've got louise timpley who's apprenticeships manager at the co-op We've got Councillor Kim Powell, who's Cabinet Member for Businesses, Jobs and Skills at Lewisham Council. And we've got our very own Joe Fortune, General Secretary of the Co-op Party. Um, so as I said, we'll go to Joe first, who's going to talk about um, the initial parts of the report. There'll be the opportunity for questions, and then we'll go to our other panellists and then have some more questions after that. Uh, so Joe, if I can hand over to you. Thanks uh, very much, Emma, and thank you uh, very much, everyone, for making some time uh, to join us uh, here on this session tonight. Um, this is our, and just before I go into uh, the report and the substance of what we're talking about uh, today, um, I just wanted to sort of make an, a little note. We're coming towards the end of the year, uh, end of 2022. Uh, this is our 30th uh, Corp Live uh, session uh, this year. Uh, so nearly a Corp Live every 10 or 11 days uh, from the from the party. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to the staff team uh, who are represented on the call uh, today, but in particular, uh, someone who lurks in the back of these calls, but puts them all together for us is Izzy Uzarelli and Izzy has done a remarkable job through the year. Uh, you, uh, If you've joined us for uh, any of the sessions uh, through, through the year, you would have seen Izzy, you would have seen uh, making sure that it all works, all comes together. And it's a really important part of our uh, arsenal in the way in which we ed educate ourselves within the Cultural Party. Our, me our members, uh, rep uh, elected representatives, a hugely important part of what we're up to. They've been high quality, they've been fantastic sessions. And for that, uh, Izzy and the team, uh, have all of my thanks and I know uh, many of yours on the call this evening so just before I got going I just want to make that note just before we tip into the Christmas uh, Christmas uh, season all told um, but look outside of that tonight we're talking about education uh, and education has been something that the cooperative movement has been involved in for an awful long time it's one of our principles it's one of the things that we found ourselves on one of the things we judge ourselves by 
And I think it's, it's really timely for ourselves to put a contribution into the world, into the uh, public po uh, po policy space uh, on education. And we've in this report, and as you can see, and you've been emailed today as in this uh, Steps to Success uh, report, we've thought a bit about our early years uh, provision in England, a bit about our primary and secondary school uh, provision, and, there's, uh, and of course, uh, apprenticeships and higher education as well. Uh, so we've we tried to do an awful lot in this report, and it's it's fair to say that this sits within our wider policy offering, uh, not just uh, in education, but right across the co-op piece. Um, so it's a, it's a really timely piece for us because we're gearing up towards things like manifestos uh, and important moments in time within the within the Westminster cycle. Uh, and this will form part and parcel of what we're putting forward uh, as a cooperative party, what we're hoping to uh, influence our sister party and the wider, uh, a wider population with in the times to come. But it's not just national politics, of course, with education, because so much of it is based in community. Is based within community experience. Is based within business experience. Is based within uh, the experience of our elected representatives and councillors right across uh, the country, and, and in this case, in England today. Um, so it's, it's something which spans our movement, spans our party, and that's why I'm really glad uh, to be part and parcel of the of the launch uh, today. I was part of a, a, a roundtable that we held yesterday uh, in Westminster, and I can see a couple of people on the call today. Uh, uh, who's uh, who were uh there as well, and I might well bring one of those in uh, at the end of my comments as well, just to give a bit of context, because it really is something that we're looking to ed uh, educate others outside of the cooperative movement about as much as, as ourselves. So we, we have this, this history, this legacy within education. There's been some parts. I've been within the party for nearly 10, 15 years, something of that sort of order. And over that period of time, we've talked about a lot of different aspects of education. We've talked about the way in which we we can generate more parent-led uh, early year uh, settings. We've talked about how uh, profit uh, shouldn't be seen uh, within the early years setting. We've talked about uh, proper funding within early years uh, provision as well. And we've talked an awful lot about how we can ensure that there is a fairer system, which is making sure that our early year settings are well-skilled, are well-funded, are in, in, in parent involved as well. Uh, we've done that work over the years in uh, primary and secondary school. Uh, I'll go back and start at maybe sort of 2005, uh, something of that order, the Education Act 2005, where Ed Balls, a Labour and Cooperative um, uh, elected representative, long before he was better known for char cha charring and, uh, and other things, or other, other dances that escape me at the minute. Uh, long before that, he was an education secretary uh, and he brought forward this piece of legislation which uh, contained pathfinders and it was all about what different types of governance model could uh, exist within uh, within secondary uh, primary and secondary school provision through that period the cooperative movement came together uh, and did two different things uh, worked within uh, uh, that pathfinder program to uh, put forward cooperative trust schools, which saw a huge explosion in number uh, through the period, uh, through over those uh, the following years, as well as uh, cooperatives like the cooperative group, uh, putting their, their, their reputation, their, their energy, their, their weight within uh, that uh, multi-academy trust approach as well. So there's two aspects uh, the cooperative movement was involved in there. And this really is our opportunity to go back, revisit some of those pieces and share our learning and that's why this paper is titled what it is, Lessons from Cooperatives in Education, because we wanted to understand what cooperatives, mid-counties, cooperative group were, were, were doing, and others, smaller parent-led cooperatives as well. You see in the, in the report uh, case studies from great organisations like Grasshoppers and Hackney and others. Um, understand what their current experience of providing education was and what was required. That's where this report's genesis is. That's where it's rooted within. And I think it's only right that the Cooperative Party is one of the, uh, the, the, the amplifiers of that experience, amplifiers of, uh, of that learning. So I'm really glad that we've done this report. We've done some different things with this report as well. Uh, so for the first time, we've been asking members about what their experience, parent members, uh, guardian members, what their experience of childcare has been. Um, and we've been surveying members and we've been collecting experience 
experience and, and data in that area. And it's been absolutely fascinating because sometimes I think that policy uh, sometimes exists in, in ivory towers. And I don't think that that's the case with this report because it has been uh, so influenced by those who are either receiving uh, education service or delivering and I think that that's a really important grounding for it and it's and it shed some real commonalities uh, commonalities of experience commonalities of, of need as well and I think that's uh, really important for any uh, report to come from a, a solid position of understanding um, so th that's the journey to here and, and, and just before I sort of touch on a couple of the aspects of uh, the recommendations in particular I want to talk about where we're off to I referenced uh, the manifesto, I referenced other pieces, but think about what we in the Cooperative Party are trying to do. We're trying to grow the cooperative movement. That's what we're trying to do. That's what our key, key purpose is. How do we ensure that more parts of the economy, parts of society, parts of community benefit from our cooperative values and principles? That's a key aspect of what we're up to. We're up to ensuring that people understand what the cooperative movement does make sure that we're as visible as we can be because sometimes and i've heard it said we're a great uh, you know best kept secret and i don't want to be a best kept secret i want to be much louder we want to be much more visible and it's through pieces like this which we're going to be able to educate others about what the cooperative movement is doing as well so we've got the the manifesto pieces we've got those uh, parts of the future uh, mapped out with with important uh, uh, foundational pieces of work like this together. But also it's about how we can communicate with others. Can we ensure that uh, uh, councillors across the country, we're blessed, uh, we've got th nearly 1300 uh, councillors uh, right across the country now. We've got nearly uh, representation on nearly 80% of all UK councils. Can we make sure that we're providing real quality input, quality information, quality journeys into those councils? This could form part of that work uh, in the new year. Can we make sure that our local parties are the strongest advocates for cooperation that they can be? Can we make sure that our regional parties are having those discussions, which inspire others to get further involved in the courts of party and the courts of movement? That's what this work is all about. That's where these pieces of work take us. So that's our that's our trajectory. That's what we've been doing with, with the work. And you can see some of it here uh, in, in some of the recommendations. Uh, and there will be people here with different experiences of all uh, aspects of educational provision, whether early years is higher education in, in secondary as well of course um, and I think that as, a, as someone who has been a recipient of uh, early years uh, uh, care with my, my own children uh, over the last seven years I'm so heartened by some of the strength of the recommendations because it really speaks to me it speaks to my own personal experience it, we talk about ratios we talk about ensuring that our children are sent to uh, early year settings which are adequately staffed adequate adequate care for the the, the the children you drop off in the morning the children you walk away from and you hope are, are receiving the sort of care that they might do at home and that's why this particular one especially in stretched financial times uh, that first recommendation uh, recommend you can see there in your report uh, in front of you that maintaining that ra ratio of one to four is really important. It's something that I know it, other early years uh, settings uh, are struggling with. Uh, they're struggling with staff retention, they're struggling with the finances, and it takes us on to the meat of some of the early years uh, settings recommendations here, which is about funding. It, it's crazy. And, and it happens in a, a number of different policy areas, uh, but something like concessionary buses is a really good example of this, where you say, oh, well, you're entitled to. Now, the system itself doesn't allow for that entitlement to come through. So you, you are entitled to a certain number of uh, uh, hours of uh, early years uh, provision, but your childcare provider can't put it up. You know, so you feel you're entitled, but the, the, the lack of available finance within the system means that the, what the government's really doing is putting a huge amount of financial pressure on providers by not adequately funding. And it's the same with the buses. Why are all the other buses so expensive? It's because they don't adequately fund what they say is the entitlement. And there's a number of different parts of uh, public policy which have, that, uh, with that, which have that problem. But I think it's really important within early years uh, that we've talked about sustainable funding for the sector as well and then into what is the cost of living crisis you know one of the big parts of cost of living for many is the cost of childcare. i've been paying you know personally and i don't mind sharing amongst friends i i've been paying nearly 1200 pounds for the last seven years a month uh, for my for my my childcare. 
like that invoice comes every single month and it is scary and like it's a it's a huge huge amount of money which allows for myself and, and my partner to go back out to work and like that is why I, I feel so strongly about some of the pieces that we have here about proper uh, proper and earlier provision of free childcare 30 30 hours we talk about here extended to all two-year-olds that doesn't exist currently in the system in England and so I'm really pl pleased about that and then we've got other uh, recommendations here as well about Ofsted and um, that's the other bit so we've dropped off the children we're paying for them but are people adequately looking are people adequately trained and ready to look and come in and make the right sort of judgments which means something to the parents means something to the local authorities uh on that sort of setting because there is a really diffuse um uh, provision of early years there's thousands of independent nurseries they're shrinking of course because of the system the broken market uh, but there's so many other providers and we've got to make sure we've got Ofsted right as well so there's some some aspects of the early year settings which I was particularly taken with um, and I'll move on and I'm going to bring in uh, and we've got we're, we're blessed we've got Russell Gill uh, and just uh, and forgive me Emma I'm going to free, freelance ever so slightly uh, but don't worry don't mute me just yet Emma uh, because we've got Russell Gill uh, with us and, and Russell is Chair of Governors of, of CAT is the Cognitive Academies Trust and Russell uh, is a, 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 a not only a long time education specialist within the Cognitive Movement but is now doing it day in day out Russell as well so uh, I'm going to come to you as well I've just given you fair fair warn uh, Russell um, now look if we look at these recommendations ever so briefly and let's hear from Russell whether that chimes with what the, the experience of the Cooperative Academy Trust is we've got again we've got about funding we've got about a, a lack of honesty really in, in terms of uh, primary and educate uh, primary and secondary educational funding we know it's tight we know it's getting tighter and it, it at some point there's going to be a break there's going to be tough decisions to be taken and that's why it's so important that the party and the cooperative movement is fighting for for adequate funding as well as some pieces in terms of making sure that we have got the right sort of approach to uh, selections we don't think that that's a good thing you know promoting the inclusion making sure that the school is much more part and parcel of the community uh, as well it's really important aspects of the way in which we think that uh, educational uh, primary and secondary education provision uh, will be improved but of course in England so many uh, schools are now uh, as a result of government uh, decision uh, in uh, a, a, a academy ch chains and we've got to make sure that the academy chains are fit for purpose as well We've got to make sure that the system is right uh, because it, it feels like and it's felt like for a long time this is where we are now i don't think that they uh, the government who were going to have a schools bill uh pulled it the last minute we were hearing uh, just yesterday uh, we don't think that they've got all, they've they've got that system uh, fit for purpose just yet and you'll see some really technical and important recommendations in this report in that area as well but look uh, that's enough uh, for me i wanted to tee it up i wanted to make sure that we, uh, we we knew where we were coming from but russell uh, you're doing this day in day, day out it, share the experience of uh, cooperatives in the uh, this particular cooperative in the area and yeah some views about the report as well Listen, I'll, I'll take no more than two minutes of your time because i i wasn't even going to do this i just popped it i got back early from work and i thought i'll just jump on and see what I, happens and then i saw it your uncle, i got a text but listen so I, I was one of the lucky people to be at the round table yesterday and it was really really great to to catch up with uh, you know some senior shadow minister stephen morgan was there and it was great to be able to talk about the work that we do because i have to say we wouldn't be here the cup counties trust would not exist were it not for a labor co-op secretary of state persuading us that actually the co-op could make a real difference in school improvement and that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have had the opportunity to work with labor co-op councillors across the great cities of the north of england to actually find communities that would really benefit from a cooperative solution to help help improve schools that perhaps hadn't had a, a fair crack of the whip sometimes so I'm, I'm, you know, delighted that we've made progress, and I really hope that um, with a, a next Labour government, with Labour co-op um, ministers, with uh, the opportunity to continue to work in partnership with local authorities, we can continue our development. Now, a lot of it is about structures and governance and things like that, but actually there's something that's much more important than that. The thing that actually drives school improvement in our co-op academies are actually the co-op values and principles. 
the ways of being co-op are the best way of improving the life chances of young people and actually learning some really valuable lessons about 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 how to how to how to sort of uh, progress and that's sort of uh, interwoven throughout all that the, all that we do within 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 our, our multi academy trust. Now I am conscious that multi academy trusts in many areas don't necessarily have the best of reputations. My view is a simple one: there are good maps and there are bad maps. And I think it's part of what, what ought to be part of our agenda is to learn the lessons of what a good map looks like. I don't think that we're going to unwind the reform education, the reform that's taken place in education over the last couple of years. So I think oh, last five or 10 years. So I think this is actually about looking at some of the steps that can be taken. It's all about making sure that multi academy trusts have a strong and progressive and positive relationship with local authorities, making sure that local authority admissions policies are followed, fair access protocols are adopted, making sure that actually it's the local authority that's commissioning where the school should be in the area, not, uh, not because a map fancy is opening a new school in competition to what already exists. There's something really important about the inspection regime of maps, the role Joe mentioned of Ofsted. Actually, if maps are a reality, then they need to be held to account for performing in the right way. And that includes a whole myriad of things, how well they're doing school improvement, but also things like the stance that they're taking on executive pay and those sorts of issues. All of this is covered and many much more in, in Joe's policy document that the co-op party produced. And I would simply commend it to you. I think there's a really important role in which we can encourage maps to become really important civic institutions. I think that's what the Co-op Academies Trust is. I think there are other good multi-academy trusts who fulfill the same role. And I suppose what I'd like to see more than anything else is the growth of that spirit of cooperation where the values and principles that drive us become something that's, yes, something that you see in our Co-op Academies, but actually something that you see more broadly in the sector as a way of kind of improving education life chances for, for the young people in England. So listen, Joe, I'll not say any more because I'm taking up uh, time that wasn't on the agenda, but uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Oh, thank you, Russell. And I, likewise, we've we've got uh, two great speakers that I want to hear from uh, Louise and, and, and Kim as well. We want to get into apprenticeships, a hugely uh, significant aspect of the way in which this uh, country may uh, turn its fortunes around as well. So, look, uh, Emma, I'll, I, I, I'll pause at, at that moment. Uh, for Hopefully it gives you a sense of where we're, we've been and, and are going and some of the pieces uh, that I can cover off ahead of the second part of the discussion. Thank you, Joe. That was really helpful. I think, as you're saying, it just provided that kind of context as to as to where the movement has been and where we as a party have been and the kind of work that's gone into this area already, which really kind of laid the groundwork for this report. And also, as you're saying, just providing that kind of those um, those building blocks around early years and, uh, um, and and kind of college level education before we talk more about apprenticeships and uh, skills as well. Um, before I come on to our next uh, panellists, I'm mindful that I, I did say that I would pause for contributions as well at that point. We are quite running, running behind a little bit, so I will Sorry, just go to those who've got their hands up already. So, John, I can see you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in on this before we move things on to, as we're saying, that kind of skills, apprenticeships agenda? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, just so a quick introduction. Um, I'm the former chair of the Co-op Schools National Network. Um, Joe, it's nice that you briefly referenced the growth of um, local authority schools that formed partnerships through a cooperative model. Uh, I can also see that we've got a um, friend and colleague, Katie Simmons from Cressix, which is a highly successful non-academy cooperative school. Um, I'm just curious as to the oversight or perhaps the omission of that still significant sector of cooperative education. There are still 450 in that figure, um, cooperative schools which work alongside our academy cooperative colleagues. Um, and one particular grouping, which is hugely significant at the moment, is the SEND provision for which uh, there are something like 60 cooperative providers, cooperative schools that provide uh, special needs. The whole of Kent is a single cooperative maintained sector SEND Trust. So you know, I'm, I'm expressing a, a, a gentle reminder stroke note at this point. Um, going back to the 2019 manifesto, um, we were actually involved in drafting some of that with colleagues from the Co-op Party. And I hope that there'll be some further work done on the way to a Co-op manifesto that looks 
at the various models of cooperative education that still exist and should I absolutely agree Joe uh, a lack of celebration is one of our problems I think more could and should be done through the co-op party to publicize cooperative education in all its forms and to have forgotten or overlooked you know a, a little grouping of 400 or so schools it, it's a pity so I know that if you talk to uh, schools co-op society which has been there since 2005 2006 way back um, I'm sure they'd be happy to provide information That's there you go Thanks very much, John, and you referenced that work in, uh, in myself. I think we were working together we were uh, indeed. Uh, uh, on that piece of policy, and I think it was a really good piece of policy. I referenced it yesterday. I thought that there was still huge merit in that piece of policy, which was talking about ensuring that we did more to ensure that uh, assets weren't transferred out for, for, forevermore. Uh, especially within uh, within uh, newer opening schools, free schools, uh, that's where that policy was in, in 19. And I'm really looking forward to going back into that sort of space. It was what I was saying there, John, really, is that this is a trajectory, it is a piece. That if you think we've tried to do uh, so much in, in so little time, uh, I think each one of the bullets that we've all mentioned deserve uh, at least a, a couple of hour co-op live in itself. I really look forward to working with yourselves and, and others to, to understand how we can better support uh, the, uh, the the work that is still happening uh, within within <coughs> schools and take some of the, le the learnings away from what went from in you know 2012 uh, and it through to that sort of 17 19 period because I think it's really important that we as a movement really understand what happened and what that story tells us for the future and the future uh, labor and cooperative government as well so thanks for the point John and look forward to being in touch in the new year. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to pause it for questions at this point, otherwise we're not going to hear from our speakers. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to come to, uh, to Louise Timperley next. As I said, Louise is a apprenticeships manager at uh, the co-op. I'll hand over to her so that she can talk about their work in this area and the report. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Emma. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm apologising for my voice. I've contracted the dreaded COVID first time and it's got me uh, as I'm about to do this presentation. So apologies for that. Um, but good job we're all virtually meeting and not face to face. Um, so what I wanted to do today was to share a bit of context about uh, apprenticeships at co-op. Um, I should also also mention that I am the chair of governors at one of our co-op academies trust schools that Russell has just mentioned so um, obviously very interested to read all aspects of the report not just the parts that were in relation to apprenticeships. Now I'm going to attempt to share my screen I'm not a zoom user I'm a teams user so I'm relying on Izzy to support me here if this doesn't work. Um, let's try now then can you see a presentation of what then? Yeah, we can see it. Can you see a, Can you see just the presentation, or can you see people as well? Uh, can can see both. <laughs> How do I remove the people? <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought you meant the people on the Zoom call. I mean, yeah, yeah so that's just the yeah, lovely. Is that working for you all now? It is. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So, um, yeah, apprenticeships at the co-op. I've been an apprenticeship manager at co-op since 2017. Um, for those of you who know something about apprenticeships, you'll know that that is when something called the apprenticeship levy started, which is a government tax levied on all businesses who have got a, a, a large payroll bill. And that apprenticeship levy was put in place so that businesses were forced, if you like, to spend money on their own apprenticeship training. A business the size of co-op with 60,000 plus colleagues has a large tax bill for the levy. It's over five million pounds every year. And that was a real encouragement for us to do more with apprenticeships. We were doing a lot anyway at that point, but we know we, we knew we could do more. And um, I was employed to, to help that journey. This is just a summary of a number of different areas that we support at co-op with our apprenticeship programmes. And it was just really a slide to show you a flavour of all the different areas. We typically have between 700 and 1200 apprentices on our programmes at any one time. Um, and you can see there on the left hand side, we've got level two and three. Level two and three are sort of GCSE A-level equivalents. 
Um, and on the right hand side, we've got our higher level apprenticeship programs. So some of those are professional qualifications that are wrapped around with an apprenticeship. Um, just to give you a bit of a, a flavour of what we do, earlier this year, we set up an LGV driver programme in response to the national drivers shortage. And we've got something like 80 new drivers in our business as a result of that, all working through an apprenticeship programme. And that was a real example um, of cooperation within our business because a lot of those drivers came to us from our warehouses. So some of our colleagues who wanted to move forward in their careers and gain access to higher salaries than they were receiving in our depots moved across into our LG, LGV driver population. Just linking it also to other aspects of social mobility, um, we've got a paralegal apprenticeship programme and a solicitor apprenticeship programme now in our Southwest legal services operation. And that's given us the opportunity to promote our careers in apprenticeships um, to school leavers. So people who have joined us at the age of 18, they could have perhaps gone to university or academically able to do that, but chose not to. They chose to go into work and to start their career journey through an apprenticeship programme. And we've got, I think, 20 plus um, paralegals and solicitors now in our business, all working through those professional programmes and will end up with no uh, student debt, um, obviously aiding them in their careers um, as, they, as they move through and qualify. So that's a bit of context for apprenticeships at co-op. But what I wanted to talk about this evening is our co-op levy share programme. And basically, this is a way of us looking to support our mission to cooperate for a fairer world. And I mentioned before that we pay five million pounds a year into our apprenticeship levy pot. Even with 1200 apprentices on our programmes, we're only able to spend about two million of that five million. And the remaining three million is, is ring fenced um, for co-op to spend on its own apprenticeship programmes. But if it doesn't spend it within two years, the money goes back to Treasury. And that's the same with all businesses that pay into, into the levy. Um, so we wanted to come up with a solution for how we could actually spend this levy, make a decision on where it would go without giving it back to government so they could spend it where they felt it was appropriate to spend. So we got together with a number of different organisations who also had a levy um, that was spare. And government has said we could spend up to 25% of our levy pots on other businesses using levy transfers. If you look at this slide, that's a, a summary of a few of the businesses that joined forces with us and made a pledge to our levy share programme. They said, we've got plenty of levy left. We don't know what to do with it. Help us out, co-op. Let's see what we can do together uh, by cooperating. And we set up co-op levy share. And the main priority for levy share was to ensure that we were able to help people who had difficulty accessing apprenticeships to, um, to get on the career ladder. And so we made a condition of our levy share that we would support social mobility and that we would look to tackle some of the um, underrepresentation that exists within apprenticeships. So we were focusing specifically on areas of lower socioeconomic advantage and also people from different ethnic minority backgrounds to see whether each of these levy pledges could support. And the way the system works is that those businesses have made a pledge. And then we work with a third party who helps us to identify businesses that haven't got enough levy of their own to spend on apprenticeships. And what happens is the digital system and a bit of uh, intervention from real people make sure that the businesses are able to, uh, to, to match. And businesses who are pledging have got the opportunity to support different areas of the country, wherever they think it's most appropriate to support, or um, different areas of the sectors. So we've got a few businesses, for example, that really want to support the digital economy and only will support apprenticeships that, uh, that, that talk to that. And on this slide here, when we set up the, um, the service in May 21, we had an ambition to get a 15 million pound pledge pot within three years. We actually reached 15 million within 18 months and pleased to be able to say that we've got 16.3 million pledged already. And that's from 55 pledging organisations. With that money, we've been able to support over 1300 apprenticeship opportunities and over 900 of those individuals have started their programmes already. And just to give you one example of one of the individuals that we have supported, a young lady from ethnic minority background wanted to be a welder. 
and she was applying to a business in Bury, an engineering business who had run out of levy and were unable to support her. And um, that organisation came to us and asked us if we were, would be able to find the £27,000 that the apprenticeship cost. Um, and Sophia is now in her second year and she's sort of booking the trend really for, um, from a gender perspective and from an ethnic minority perspective as well in her, in her sector. Uh, and she really is somebody who's benefited from the service and uh, is happy to share her story far and wide with, uh, with anybody who will listen, to be honest, which is, which is great to hear. So that's, uh, that's the end of the presentation. So I don't know whether it's questions now, Emma, or you want to wait till, till later. Uh, thanks so much, Louise. Really appreciate the presentation that you've put together there uh, and for coming in when you're poorly. Thank you so much. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll go to Kim now um, and, and hear, from, hear from her and her kind of experiences uh, on the council and the work that they've been doing. And then we'll open it back out to, to questions, particularly around this kind of skills and apprenticeships agenda and that kind of part of the report. Thank you so much, Kim. Oh. Kim, you're on mute, um, forgive us. We'll just get you unmuted so we can hear you. Thank you. There Am we I go. unmuted? Yeah, we can all hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Thank you, Emma, for that. So um, I'm going to speak about apprenticeships from Lucian Council, because I'm the cabinet member for jobs, skills and businesses. So at Lucian Council, we've had an apprenticeship programme since 2008. And it's long been a priority for us as a way of helping some of our residents into good careers. So far, we've supported over 700 people into apprenticeships. Initially, our focus was on young people up to the age of 25. But a few years ago, we removed this restriction, recognising that people of all ages need to have access to apprenticeships. So whilst we still have a high level of young people on apprenticeships, we also have people who want to change their career. For, in, for, for instance, people returning to work after bringing up children or people who are working in low paid work. When a mayor Egan was first elected in 2018, he set a target to secure 250 new apprenticeships for Lucian residents in his first four years term. And I'm delighted to say that we've achieved that and have surpassed the target by getting 260 people into apprenticeship roles. Between 2018 and 2022, given half of the time was during the COVID pandemic, I think this was quite an impressive achievement. There are three main ways in which we achieved this target. Apprenticeships within the council, apprenticeships with local anchor institutions for our Lucian Deal partnership and apprenticeships with local employers, sometimes using apprenticeship levies, which you just heard about, to transfer to make this happen. Around half of the 260 apprenticeships roles were in, within the council and we managed to create opportunities in every division of the council, including social care, housing, economic development, finance and HR, and all of the roles within the council were paid at least the London living wage. These were all new hires, that means roles that were publicly advertised as opportunities for local people to apply for. To help encourage internal teams to recruit apprentices, we use some of our corporate funding, and we use this to pay for the fi first five months of salaries for apprentices. And this was helped to reduce the cost of hiring departments and provide an incentive to create opportunities. In addition to our target of 260, we've also used the apprenticeship levy to fund apprenticeships as training opportunities for 50 of our existing council staff. And this included ethnic minority management development programs, as well as programs for specific roles such as accountancy and social work. We also worked with our Lucian Deal partners. The Lucian Deal is a partnership of six anchor organisations in the borough. The Council, Hospital Trust, Lucian Homes, Phoenix Housing, Lucian College and Goldsmith University. Apprenticeships leads from each organisation meet quarterly to coordinate activities and share information about recruitment plans. And all of our partners took on apprentices 
but a special mention goes out to Lucian Hospital who employed over 50 Lucian residents into apprenticeships over the last two years. We've been working with local employers who found this a bit more challenging. The vast majority of Lucian businesses are micro businesses employing fewer than five people. So only a few of them feel they have the capacities to recruit and support apprentices. We were able to use and transfer our apprenticeship levy from the council or our Lucian partners deals to create an apprenticeships. However, the levy is only able to cover the cost of apprenticeship training rather than salary or management costs. So it isn't always attractive enough for these smaller businesses. And we found that working with apprenticeship training providers initiatives such as the London Progressive Club Collaborative are helpful in identifying those employers who might be prepared to take on apprentices using the levy transfer. This gives you a sense of how we were able to achieve our targets over the last four years. And we're also really delighted to receive some awards this year, which recognise our, our efforts. We won three out of the six categories at the London Council's Apprenticeship Awards for Best Apprentice in School, Best Manager of an Apprentice, and the Flagship Award of Apprenticeship of the Year. While looking at the report, there's certain things that we really do agree with. There has been a significant decrease in the number of lower level qualification, which bears out in the recommendations in the report that's in front of you today. So it's clearly something's not quite right. Now, one of the things that um, we wanted to say that is essential to provide high level courses for people to better progress and have a quality service, but also learn as you earn so that people don't have the burden of university fees. This is why apprenticeships can be so valuable in your organizations. Now, some of, how do we keep apprenticeships? What can we do to make sure that apprentices are important in our organizations, in the councils? So one thing we did in Lewisham, we set it as part of our manifestation and focused on keep delivering quality apprenticeships. So keeping apprenticeships at the top of the agenda. So when it's part of the manifesto, uh, manifesto it's embedded in the work that we do in the council. Another one of the recommendations from the report is increasing the flexibility of the apprenticeship levy spending criteria. As I mentioned before, we can only use the money for training. So sometimes the smaller organizations aren't keen on doing this because it doesn't cover the, the um, doesn't cover, less, cover salaries. So if one of the recommendations that are brought forward are the increase in the flexibility of the apprenticeship levy, some of that money could be used to perhaps do salaries, pension costs, costs et cetera. And, organizations won't have to send large amounts of money back to the council. So one of the things I would recommend is set, if you can get this as part of your manifestation, so we can keep it focused, have a culture in your um, organization where apprenticeships are embedded and so that um, departments are keen to do apprenticeships. And this will keep it on the top of the agenda. And because of the way we've done this, we've produced these quality apprenticeships and that's why Lucian has been recognized and we've received awards. And looking at also opening options outside of the borough. So it gives people the opportunity to see apprenticeship as a, a, an opportunity, a way of working and learning at the same time and looking at, a career or an idea you may never have thought about. So if when we what we do in, in, in our team, we look at apprenticeships that people would never have dreamed of doing. And, and it's a way of opening people's eyes and it's a way of people having an opportunity they never thought they could do. And apprenticeships can do this because as I said before, you work and you earn. So um, this is my contribution and thank you so much for inviting me to talk about it.
Thank you so much, Kim. It's brilliant to hear about your experiences at the council and the way that the, the council has been able to, to work to develop um, those opportunities uh, through apprenticeships. So thank you. So that's the that's the, the last of our three speakers. So as we said, is obviously those earlier contributions were more focused on the other aspects of the report and the later ones on apprenticeships and skills. So I'll reopen uh, to questions at this point. And I can see we've got a few hands up. So I'll take things in rounds of three. Um, so can I come to Cynthia first of all, please? And just unmute you, Cynthia, if you just bear with us and we'll be able to get your question. One second, just having a couple of technical problems there. Myself. Ah, can there we go. Just unmute oh, yeah. Sorry. Right. Um, this, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, my question comes from a, a position of ignorance in a, in a sense. I haven't read the report, but um, I have for a long while been a bit obsessed about the lack of um, opportunities for really skilled people, tradesmen, to pass on their knowledge. And I wondered whether that is possible within the scheme of art or whether it would be possible to create small uh, cooperatives of people in particular trades so that they could share apprenticeships, etc. cetera. Um, so much needs to be done in the building industry to get it back on its on, on track to do things that are good instead of building crummy houses. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Uh, also, just to flag, I've had uh, one or two people querying about the report. So if you registered for the event um, before today, uh, the report was sent to you this morning. Uh, otherwise, Izzy, my colleagues, just shared the link for it in the chat there. Um, so that should be something that you can access now or at your, at your leisure over the coming days. So thank you. And thanks for that contribution, Cynthia. Uh, Tom, if I can come to you next. Hi, thank you for that, and uh, thank you for everyone who's spoken. Um, so I want to touch on two points. So the first, first point is um, it's a kind of a, a bugbear of mine that the report doesn't really touch on, which is the lack of awareness of cooperation as a thing. So if you take something like business studies um, as, as a subject area, people are taught about businesses from a traditional corporate governance present. They're not presented with these other uh, models that are, exist they're not talking about ownership and we all know that ownership matters so that's and I, I, I I'm I would hope that the curriculum can be to introduce some level of understanding about these alternative business forms then a second point I really want to touch on very briefly was um, just from as policy officer for cooperatives UK I'm really interested in what um, we can do to support members in terms of supporting more mats and if that's something but that's a separate conversation another point but i wanted to flag here is what can cooperatives uk do to support and reach out to wider members in terms of this with the co-op group thank you so much for that tom if uh, i can come to dennis next uh, we'll just unmute you dennis you just bear with us Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, well, there's rather a lot now, but I'll limit it very to a few points. The most important point, I did read the document, um, and I'm very keen on uh, stressing the international nature of the cooperative movement. I didn't see anything about that in there. So I was disappointed in that because I have raised that again and again at conference and at other meetings. Uh, on that line, uh, I think we need to have more mentioned about the role of the co-op college. And in particular, I would like to see the mention of WEA and the potential for cooperation between WA, co-op schools, the co-op college, and so on, uh, in presenting a curriculum uh, that includes the co-ops. Uh, referring to the last speaker, I think that one way around that might be to actually talk about whole variety of different models of business, uh, including uh, you know, joint ventures and partnerships and franchising, management contracts. So it isn't just about co-ops and non-co-ops. Um, 
Then I would also like to mention something about one of the ladies raised the question of what can we do about experienced um, uh, professionals. Uh, one of the things that we had started in Scotland many, many years ago was a thing whereby there would be a drop in workshop for uh, retired or resting uh, professionals where there would be things for them to work on. And, and this would also be available to young people who were thinking about what they wanted to do so they could actually talk and work alongside such people uh, in order to make the earliest steps. But I think the earliest steps are quite important. And finally, I'd like to say that although apprenticeships are very important, I think it's also important that um, we remember the rest of FE and particularly there's a need, I think, for a broad ranging qualification which prepares people to be good citizens, including good cooperative citizens, uh, rather than specializing only in particular fields. And maybe this could be like a foundation year uh, and people then go on and do other things. So those are my immediate quick points. Lovely. Thanks so much, Dennis. I'm going to come to our uh, other panelists um, to, to, to reply on some of the points that have been made in those three questions there. And then I'm going to freeze it at that point with the three speakers that I can see have got their hands up at the moment, just because we are starting to run quite short on time. Uh, so, Louise, can I come to you for any contributions and responses you want to make to the comments that have been made from those uh, from those questions? Yes, thank you. Um, for, to, to Cynthia's point um, about bringing in um, tradespeople that have got lots of skills that they, they could pass on to, to the younger generation. I think there's a real challenge in, in the sector, and um, I think it was Dennis that also mentioned FE in general. Um, what we've got out there in the um, in the marketplace is individuals who are working within professions are actually quite well paid in some sectors. But unfortunately, that pay rate doesn't transfer into the pay that they would receive if they were training individuals in an FE college or in, in other um, apprenticeship training providers. So it tends to be individuals that have lost the desire um, to actually work in, in a profession in that way uh, or who have a real vocation to, to want to be able to pass on their skills. Um, I think it's an interesting concept that you discussed there, Cynthia, cooperative movement. It could could um, there be more of a cooperative way to approach that rather than looking at what we've got now, which is FE colleges and independent providers. So it, it's something that perhaps needs, needs to be to be looked into. But that, that was my thoughts on, uh, on the questions as I've just heard. Thanks so much, Louise. And Kim, if you want to come in with any comments at this point. Yeah, um, thank you. I think one of the things that we we need to look at is, and it was actually flagged as one of the recommendations, is the lack of flexibility. We can only do the courses that are on the list. So sometimes we want to do something a bit different, but if it's not on the list, we can't do it. It has to be those accredited courses. So that makes us stuck. And also, um, um, I think it's Cynthia mentioned about people coming in and um, builders to come and help, but we are not flexible with the levy. We can only use it for certain things and that's training and it doesn't cover things like salaries. So the recommendations from this report also looked at the lack of flexibility. But I think people are coming up with some really good suggestions like intergenerational working, people coming out of retirement and looking at different things in the apprenticeship, but our hands are quite tied with what we can do. And hopefully if some of the recommendations are picked up, it will give us that flexibility to use the money as we would like to, and also look at the kind of training that we could provide. Lovely. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and I, I would just say, I think um, uh, probably echoing a couple of the comments which uh, which Joe made earlier is that, you know, there's a, a few kind of the contributions which were there about kind of things that people would like to see, or things that people would like to see kind of more of or kind of an enhanced um, an enhanced um, part to, uh, uh, to to things that were perhaps mentioned is to say that um, this isn't the end. This is this is as we said. This is a trajectory. This is a direction of travel. This is about you know trying to provide really a, a snapshot and a bit of feedback from particularly practitioners in the field at the moment as to their experiences of what has been quite the 
fast changing sector um, over the last decade or so and kind of where they see the current challenges are and the direction of travel that we need to go in to respond to it to absolutely kind of take the feedback that have been uh, that's been made there of things that could be um could, that could be included and things that perhaps could have a, an additional role and um, but again just to say you know there's there's so much that's in there which could actually kind of um in, in some ways take over the whole paper uh, it is a case of kind of trying to, to 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 cover that kind of broad area as much as we possibly could uh, just on one specific though um just around our work with the with the co-op college uh, sadly um one of our uh, we had asked the co-op college to uh to, to come along this evening fortunately they just won't be able to, to to provide a speaker at this particular time on this particular evening but it's certainly um you know an important uh partner who we who we look to work with going forward on this area as well and I will come to the next round of questions now. So I've got Ryan, Kavan, and Angela. Um, if we can do it in that order, Ryan. Um, hello. Um, I'll be honest, I wanted to say something with what Tom and Dennis said, because they were recommended about uh, when you're taught business. Um, I'm in college now. I get taught a business course. And a good chunk of one of my units was actually teaching about different ownership types and it did actually include cooperatives so I thought they might be interested in to know that it does already happen to a certain extent well I thought everyone would be interested to know that and um, they even teach a good chunk of corporate social responsibility it's an entire unit corporate social responsibility so I just thought people might like to know that in part those things do already exist in like the mainstream college Thank you very much for that contribution, Ryan, and fantastic to, to, to hear particularly experienced, as you say, of um, someone at the moment who's, um, who's, who's learning those particular courses. Thank you so much. Uh, if we can come to uh, Kavan. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I'd say one area that really needs covering is, is, is industry, because obviously one thing that the country is looking to do is to grow British industry and create the jobs of the future that are one, going to give people secure, stable employment, two, give people a wage they can, they can live off, and three, give, uh, you know, give, you know, so like recreate so like an industrial base for the country. So what I'd be looking to ask would be, what sort of apprenticeships are we going to be able to offer for, for, for people looking to get into industry and people looking to actually train up in that? So, you know, they could be manufacturing, um, sex parts of heavy industry, um, science and te science, technology and engineering, um, even 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 the digital industries of the future, such as such as um, software development. Artificial intelligence and smart technologies—all these different things that could be that could be that could be really, you know, used to the advantage of the country. So, my question would be: Is if we can bring those all together, can, is there a possibility that they could be maybe industry cooperatives created or industrial cooperatives created? So, so rather than just having country you know you know companies from outside the uk coming in and creating the jobs we create the jobs here ourselves where there's good where there's good work in terms of conditions there's good pensions there's um good quality products being made and I and the, finally to finish off with i would say that we would need to be able to be in a position where we can sort of help re-establish re industry in the country so it can, re you know, rebalance the economy as well. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you so much. If I can come lastly to Angela. Oh, hi. Um, I'm from Camden. <clears throat> and for many years, I've been lead member for Education and Children's Services. And several years ago, to resist academization, essentially, we set up an organisation called Camden Learning, uh, which is a partnership, quite an equal partnership between all our schools. We don't have many academies, we've resisted it, uh, and the council. And the, it is a, it's a legal company um, and it's responsible um, by way of a commission from the council, quite a generous one, for increasingly more and more aspects of 
education within Camden. And uh, forgive me, I haven't read the report I'm into today, but I certainly will do it first thing tomorrow. But I just wondered within the cooperative, because we did consider being a cooperative, um, where the council lies, because we're quite keen on the importance of that relationship as well. Lovely. Thank you so much. Uh, if I can come to our speakers um, and we'll just have a few final remarks on those questions there. And then I'm afraid we're going to have to draw things to a close. I'm sorry, I realise that there's still some hands outstanding there. Uh, so Louise, if I can come to you, first of all, if you want to respond to the questions and any final comments you want to make. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I've just popped um, a link in the chat, which is uh, the Institute for Apprenticeships, and it shows all the different types of apprenticeships that exist. I think it was Kavan who was interested in the different sectors there. It is worth a look, actually, because it's quite a surprise when you see the sort of 700 or so apprenticeships that do exist. Um, it does rely on businesses getting involved, though, and actually looking through and deciding which apprenticeships are best for their business. So when we look at people investing in skills, um, many employers already use apprenticeships, as we know, but it, for businesses that don't use apprenticeships, the system's a little bit flawed because we haven't got enough resource within government to go out to businesses and promote the, the, the apprenticeship route uh, for them uh, in order to benefit their, their sector and their own businesses. So I've just put that in there um, just out of interest for everybody to have a look at. Um, and I just wanted to say there's been a, a, an awful lot of interesting stuff that's been discussed this evening, some of which I'm not that familiar with, but it's really given me uh, a flavour to go out and find out a little bit more about everything that people have spoken about this evening. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to get involved this evening. Thank you. And thanks so much for your contributions, Louise. Uh, Kim? Thank you. Um, um, that was interesting for you that you gave us this information, Ryan. Thank you so much. With Kevin, what I wanted to say is, as Lucian, we, when we do transfer our levy, we do make sure that whoever we transfer it to, they must pay the London living wage because it's really important that that apprentices are learned are able to live a certain standard of living, and we don't want people to not be to be able to enjoy living in London. And also you talked about courses um, and about for, um, looking at into the future. Now, a lot of um, in the construction industry, we're looking at retrofitting. And one of the jobs that's gonna be coming up a lot is pup installation. So that is something we're trying our best to invest in. And we're gonna to look to see there are apprenticeships for this because it is gonna be a highly paid job that we don't have nowhere near enough pump installation um, people to do this. And Angela, just quickly regarding um, working with the council, um, I can only speak for Lewisham, but in Lewisham, most of the councillors are cooperative um, councillors and we do all buy into the, the aims and objective of the corporate of the cooperative. So this is something that we are heavily invested in and we do really look and see what things are coming out. So I just want to thank you, Emma, for inviting us to be here and Izzy for all your hard work and all the preparation you've given us, given to us. And thank you for everyone to listen for listening about what we're doing here in Lucian. Thank you. And thank you so much for those uh, comments, Kim. Um, just, to, just to really quickly round things up, um, similar to, to Echo, to thank uh, Ryan for his, uh, for his, um, you know, for his very lived experience at the moment and uh, what he um, has been taught through his, because um, it's, a, it's a long time since I was in school, <laughs> so I couldn't give you the uh, curriculum of any of the uh, subjects that, uh, that, that I did back then, so it's great to have someone who's, uh, who's really living it in a, in a more contemporary way, um, but also kind of the additional comments that were made, um, and really interesting, thank you for sharing, Louise, uh, that link, which just shows the different apprenticeships which are available, but I think, as, as Kavan said, it's going to be an important part of our industrial strategy going forward, and I know that kind of where this overlaps um, with the work of of Johnny Reynolds that this is something that he'll be particularly interested in as well and just finally say Angela there it is covered um to some degree in the report it does talk about kind of the relationship that exists between those co-op academy trusts with local authorities and that kind of ability to 
um, in some ways kind of restore some of the democratic accountability that sometimes local authorities feel has lost through the academization mm, yeah. of, of schools. And um, so I just encourage you to, to, to have a look at that to see how it, how it works in that in that way. Um, but just to uh, finally just say a huge thank you again to our speakers. Really, really grateful for you coming and sharing your experiences in this and also for the contributions that have been made from all of um, all of our members this evening um, I think this is clearly something that's just evoked such a lot of uh, you know such a lot of passion and interest um, and people have got such a lot of ideas as to where we can go with this next which I think is really really positive and um, but just to say thank you again and uh, I'll let you all get on with your evening and see you soon and if I don't say have a lovely Christmas um, and thanks again see you later <laughs>